So today we have two speakers, one from um, the defense industry and one from, um, from DARPA. And they're both gonna give you some very interesting talks on uh, emerging technologies, disruptive technology, um, and, and a concentration in robotics and autonomy, which I know is a topic you are all very, very engaged in. So today we first have Dr. Brad Towsley, who is the acting VP of Advanced Concepts and Technology um, for Raytheon Intelligence and Space. Um, before joining Raytheon uh, Technologies, he has had a very impressive career that spanned both private industry, the DOD, and the military. He served as the director of the DARPA Tactical Technologies Office. And that's a very high position at DARPA that has a lot of influence over the techn technology development relating to um, advanced platforms and systems. Um, and it spans all domains, all the way from space, air, land, sea, and undersea. Um, he was a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, and he received both his uh, master's degree and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Rochester. <clears throat> in addition to um, Dr. Towsley, we have Dr. Timothy Chung, who is currently a program manager at DARPA in that same office, the Tactical Technologies Office. Um, before joining DARPA, he was the Deputy Director of the Secretary of the Navy's Initiative for the Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems Education and Research. He served as an Assistant Professor at the Naval Postgraduate School and also at the same time as the Director of the Advanced Robotic Systems Engineering Laboratory. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree <clears throat> and uh, in mechanical engineering and also aerospace engineering from Cornell and his master's degree and PhD from Caltech. And his research interests include autonomous vehicles, unmanned air vehicles, collaborative autonomy and distributed decision-making. So you have an opportunity here to talk to folks who are on the very leading edge of some very important emerging technologies. So please make sure to um, ask your questions in the chat. Don't forget to sign in and uh, with that, Thank you both very much for joining us today as our speakers, and I'll turn it over to Brad. Thanks, Jen, very much. I, I really appreciate that, that wonderful introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here today uh, virtually and to talk to all these great young people as they, you know, part of their, part of the young career getting into science and technology. I, I'm really, really happy to be able to talk to you, and, and after I talk, I'm happy to be able to hand it over to Dr. Tim Chung. He's just a super individual, and I know you'll be engaged with his presentation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about emerging and disruptive technologies today and, and wrap up with some predictions that hopefully uh, may come true in your lifetime. So, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about me. I'll talk about Raytheon technologies and then talk about some technology predictions. Uh, Dr. Watson really covered it. Um, I, I had a, a varied education background. I spent some time in the US military. Um, while I was in the military, they gave me a chance to go back to graduate school. While I was in graduate school, that's where I truly discovered my love for science and technology. I, I think many of you have already discovered that. Um, and then after some time in the military, I was able to spend some time in the, in the US government and the intelligence community. Uh, I did work at DARPA for a, a long period of time and that was just a, just a wonderful experience. And then on the right-hand side, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work in small, medium and large businesses in the course of my career. And you know, I always tell people that once they get their education and if they spent some time in the government, the military, and you got in that private sector, try all different kinds of businesses. They're all different and unique, and they're all just a blast. And uh, at present, I'm at Raytheon Technologies and very happy to be there. So Raytheon Technologies um, is, is a very large company. Um, it was formed as an integration of Raytheon and United Technologies in April of 2020. And really, what, what just to give you some idea of what we do today, uh, this chart just kind of gives you a list of all kinds of things that Raytheon Technologies does from you know, actuation, cargo, propeller systems, aerostructures. Pratt & Whitney is now a part of, you know, of Raytheon Technologies and they make engines. So if you're flying on a, on a commercial airline or on a trip someday and you look down there at the engine off the right side of the wing or the left side, you may be looking at one of our engines. We do things like avionics. We work cybersecurity. We have a huge number of people working data analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, we do missile defense, we do mission systems, we do power controls. You see in the lower right there, a picture of a satellite. We do all kinds of stuff like that. So very big company and all kinds of capabilities and all focused on advanced technology. I'm a part of one of those four businesses. So Raytheon Technologies has four individual businesses and I actually work 
as a technology executive in Raytheon Intelligence and Space. We have about 37,000 people over the United States, about $15 billion in sales. And on the left-hand side there, we do things like advanced sensors, we do cyber and training and software solutions. Um, and our, really our focus is to deliver disruptive technologies to support our customers in the, largely in the military and the intelligence community to succeed in any domain against any challenge. That, that is our commitment. As we say, challenge accepted, we take on that challenge. I specifically work in the advanced technology piece of that, where we focus on disruptive capabilities and, and trying to solve really, really hard problems. The kinds of things that we do in advanced concept and technology, we have people that work on quantum computing, um, which is a new form of computing where it fuses computer science and engineering and physics for new ideas. We have large numbers of people that work on electro-optical and infrared sensors, you know, thermal detection sensors, because we're worried about situational awareness on the battlefield for our warfighter customers. Believe it or not, we're working on synthetic biology, just like uh, software science, computer science and software engineering has been maturing over the last 25 years from a, a nascent discipline to something that's really rigorous now. Biology is undergoing the same sorts of rigorous development from an analog domain to what I call a digital domain. And in that we're combining biology and engineering to look at new capabilities and materials. We do a lot of work with active optical systems like light detection and ranging systems um, that can be used in all kinds of military and commercial applications. For many of the things that we develop, we're, we, we start with a physics-based modeling and simulation approach because we can do that from a digital engineering thread now. Uh, in the past, everything might be done in pen and paper, but in the future, we try and model and simulate almost everything we do first to minimize the, you know, the number of iterations of an engineering design cycle or a, or a scientific experiment cycle before we try it the first time. We work a lot on secure processors. And what I mean by that is if you have an iPhone or an Android in your hand every day, you have a processor within that. And, and in that, we implicitly trust that those processors are gonna do what we ask them to do. Well, the military is very concerned as processors are made globally that we have processors that we can use and trust. And so we do a lot of work of looking at the next generation of that computing and trying to make sure those systems are are secure. Distributed battle management, we do a lot of work in software. And you know, the US military is scattered all over the world doing different things. And a big part of that is how the software that underlays all of our command and control systems operates efficiently and allocates resources and enables the warfighters to protect themselves in real time. And so that piece of software we call the distributed battle management, we do a lot of work in that. I'm sure you've heard the, the buzzword artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, it's, been, it's been under development for probably 40 years, but it's really come to, to the forefront in the last five or 10 years. And the way I think about artificial intelligence that at least Raytheon technology applies, it overlays everything we do because the improvement in the analysis of the data that we collect will allow us to do our job even better. And so it's not like it's one focused area, it's in everything we do now. And last but not least, we do a lot of work in, in advanced concept and technology and cybersecurity. You can read the paper almost any day and find out some new nascent cybersecurity threat. And because we're so dependent on the digital domain now, applying cybersecurity emerging technologies to that fifth domain is so important. Those are kind of just like a, a small nugget of the expand. We have about 2000 people in ACT working on projects at any one time. And these are just a sampling of some of the areas that we work on. And then perhaps at some point in the future, you'd like to work on those, some, areas, some of those areas as well once you complete your schooling. So I want to take a few minutes to just throw out some tech predictions um, for you to think about. And then maybe four or five years down the line, you're going to say, yeah, uh, hey, I heard that in the past. That was right. Or, hey, that didn't happen. So the first one, autonomous race car Grand Prix. I know Tim, Tim would have a lot he could talk about here. But, you know, we still predict that in five years, cars are not going to be fully autonomous and that we're not going to have a complete Grand Prix that is, you know, without humans. I'm not sure how exciting that would be. Um, there's still a lot of interest in having a human drive a car. So I would encourage you to go ahead and get your driver's license. Yeah, I think Uber's good. I think Lyft is great in terms of getting from point A to point B. But we still think in five years that uh, we're not certain we're gonna have a completely autonomous Grand Prix yet, but we'll have to see. Um, autonomous air vehicle racing. I I'm not sure I'm gonna even comment on that. I'm gonna let Tim talk about that. But I think in the future, you're gonna see more and more drones in the area. I think there'll be more and more of this integration of humans and, and autonomous systems working together. I really think that, that that is a future of how, how we work together with autonomous systems and, and racing may be one way. Um, autonomous cognitive assistance. I think this one is definitely gonna happen that, that 
the, the ability of artificial intelligence to help the commander or a warfighter on the ground in the battlefield make decisions and do their job better. I think that's going to happen. It's happening quickly. The only question is how much assistance and how much data will be involved. But I think we're going to see that. Uh, remote sensing, this is kind of already happening, but we think future A, artificial intelligence was going to analyze imagery for earth science, business, and intelligence. It's already happening to a certain degree, but I think it's going to be just even more dominant in the future. Many of you may have read articles where you see about these constellations of small satellites that we call proliferated LEO or PLEO. We just think that the, you know, that, that the low and medium and geosynchronous orbit and beyond are going to be dominated with more and more satellites with remote sensing capability. And all that data is going to get analyzed. And we think it's going to help whether it's for Earth science or for business and intelligence. Um, CubeSats, you may have already had the opportunity to do this, or you may have the opportunity to do it as an undergraduate. Um, but I can't tell you how many universities in the United States are starting to work on CubeSats. And what's going to happen is the lower launch costs that are happening from um, a variety of launch companies, SpaceX and Blue Origin and others, those lower launch costs are going to increase opportunities for you to launch a satellite. And I think that's something if in college, if you want to do that, that's definitely going to be a possibility. Serious game design. Um, you know, you probably know a lot more about gaming than I do. I know my three kids do. But I really think that the, the virtual training that's enabled by serious game design is really going to improve um, the ability of our, of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and, and Marines, and, and airwomen and Marines, to do their job um, to train on any system from anywhere in the world. But for anybody that spent time in the military like I have, the cost of training to do your job is really, really um, significant. And anything that we can do to make that virtual is gonna allow people to do their job better. And I really think that serious game designs are gonna get even better with improvements in the graphical processing units and things like that. And I really think that's gonna really help that. And maybe you can be a part of that. Embedded security and hardware hacking. You know, there's always this generation every year that says, hey, you know, future systems are gonna be hack proof and we're gonna fix that and it's not gonna happen. Well. I think the general view in, 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 in the defense ecosystem community is that future systems aren't gonna be hack proof. We are just gonna to have to live with the fact that cybersecurity is an imperative and that we're gonna to have to build systems that are resilient despite the fact that they can get hacked. And I think that's gonna to continue to be um, the point in the future. Although I would love to see each and every one of the 329 of you work on you know, making that a reality and developing a hack proof system in the future. I think it's good for all of us. Metalytics, data science for health and medicine. This is happening already, but it's going to happen even more. The ability to take advantage of artificial intelligence and, and all this processing horsepower and big data tools to help us screen for pathogens, um, to help us with healthcare, all that stuff is going to happen. The only question is how big is it going to be? But, but I really think, you know, there was a, it was in DARPA from 2013 to 17. And I remember listening to the leadership that really say that they thought that the you know, the 20th century was, was the era of silicon. I really think the 21st century is going to be the era of biology and medicine and data and the integration of all three together. Underwater Autonomous Vehicle Challenge. I'll, I'll let Tim talk about this one, but I, I really believe that the same sorts of things of autonomy in the air and the ground, and even in space that are happening, are really going to happen undersea. And, and we're going to be able to do all kinds of good things for the environment, keeping in mind that 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. What kinds of things can we do from, a, from an underwater autonomous standpoint to, to help our environment, to understand it better? You know, the, the ocean bottoms are not all completely mapped and we just don't know everything about it. So maybe that'll be a help there. Quantum software, I really believe in this, that, that you know, traditional what's called pipeline processors are going, we will evolve into quantum computation systems. There are certain classes of problems that a quantum computer can solve that classical computers cannot. Um, we've been working on it for about 20 or 25 years, and um, I really believe that qubits will become a term that all of you will know, not simply, you know, bits of information or digits, but you're going to understand in the next five years what qubits are all about and how those will help us solve problems that we simply can't solve today. And last but not least, unmanned air systems, you know, all kinds of unmanned air systems, you know, once they completely clear through the FAA's, you know, certification and airworthiness in that process, I really think that these unmanned systems in the air are going to do all kinds of things for us. This is just one example of a, a new type of a radar system that might be capable for collecting imagery through you know, bad weather on the ground, 
But I think that that swarms of information that can be collected from these unmanned air systems are going to be really amazing. And there'll be all kinds of commercial applications and others that we simply haven't thought through. So I encourage you all to make your own predictions, but those are just possible ideas for you to think about for the next five years. So the last thing I wanted to, to say is that, you know, Raytheon Intelligence and Space and, and have been doing beep, have been doing internships for a long time. We love internships. We love in, you know, interacting and having high school and college students work with us and for us over the summertime or any other time of the year. Um, you know, the fundamental point about an internship, it helps you because you get experience to see what industry is doing and what life is like outside of school. Frankly, it also helps those of us that, that host the internships because it gives us a chance to interact with young people and to see how you're doing and to, and to hopefully inspire you to stay in science and technology. And it's also, frankly, a chance to do some sort of a long-term job interview. And so I think for everybody, internships are great. And I can't strongly recommend it highly enough that in your college years that you really, and in your high school years, both of them, BeaverWorks, that internships are a great thing and a great way to spend some of your time. And this is just a, a web link that you can do to apply for at least for a Raytheon internship. I'm with Raytheon. Or you can email a recruiter or you can email me, any one of the three. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Tim. I know he's going to do a great job of talking about all kinds of things in autonomy. So, Tim, over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, can I get a thumbs up or a check mark if you can see my presentation? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, Brad, thank you so much and I'm pleased to be here. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm here at DARPA. Uh, you might have seen or learned about DARPA in the movies, but uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, I'm going to share a little bit about what DARPA does and, 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 and my little piece of the puzzle here. Um, and I'm um, excited to share that uh, I'm, a, I'm a roboticist by training. And I uh, went to college and did uh, RoboCup, which is building teams of robots playing soccer together. And I, that's kind of what I did for uh, my whole career thus far is how do I work with teams of robots, get them to do really cool and important things and do so in complex environments. And that's going to be the theme of the types of projects I share with you today. Just a little bit about DARPA and, and highlighting how this relates to you all at, at Beaverworks. Uh, DARPA is interested in the nugget of uh, of uh, the commodity that DARPA is interested in is this notion of technological surprise. We're interested in creating technological surprise, the thing that's gonna wow and totally disrupt the space of technology, but also preventing technological surprise. That means getting there first, anticipating where the ins and outs might be and being able to prevent uh, the United States from being surprised uh, if, if uh, other technologies arise. So in the context of technology and, and its surprise, uh, I wanted to share these sets of questions that I hope you maybe print out or snap a picture. Uh, I actually keep it on my wall and on my badge, um, but this is called Hellmeyer Catechism or Hellmeyer Questions. You could Wikipedia this. And these sets of questions get asked not only to all program managers here at DARPA, but to anyone who wants to do a project. I used it for even my graduate work. Um, and so what are you trying to do? So I encourage you as you're working through all of your future projects to ask these types of questions and be able to maybe jot down some notes, see how well you can answer these questions. And it really helps uh, to define the types of problems that you're gonna be overcoming in your research. And so to highlight how I use these Hellmeyer questions and applied it to a handful of projects that I've been able to do here at DARPA, the first one I wanted to share was the notion of the Service Academy Swarm Challenge. This was a case where I'm handing uh, large teams, uh, 25 drones uh, on two sides, and they're basically playing capture the flag and laser tag simultaneously over the fields of a, of a flight test range. So let me show you this. And this occurred a couple of years ago, happened to release this video on May 4th. For those of you who get it, 4th of May. And what you'll see are seniors at these universities taking these technologies in the field, deploying them, and being able to develop the software and the know-how to go and take out each other's perspectives.
Drones have to land on opposing bouncy castles to score points. You can also tag each other in the sky to score points that way. And so I encourage you to go on YouTube, just type DARPA Swarm Challenge, and you'll be able to get the full length videos and see all the research that was done. Again, at the, at the senior in college levels, uh, you're able to go and do that. Another area that's currently ongoing, this is called the offset, offset program. And so now before we were dealing with maybe 25, 30 drones on a given team. Now let's imagine what would happen if you had, let's say 250 robots, air and ground robots now trying to work in really complex environments. So the key takeaway here is I like to imagine what if aliens had taken over Manhattan or downtown Los Angeles or, or Cambridge and you needed to use a swarm of robots to go and retake the city, how would you go about doing that? And the idea here is we want to go and, uh, you know, I can't have 250 uh, soldiers driving with joysticks. There might be novel ways that we want to uh, team with these swarms of robots to go and support this type of a mission. So we're going to go retake Boston from, from the aliens. How do we use robots to go do that? And so here's the short video that kind of highlights uh, what that kind of scenario might be. This, this program's using technologies that you can go to the nearest Best Buy or order commercially off the shelf and think about how do we stitch all of this together? And so imagine you're now that orchestra symphony conductor. You don't tell each musician what note to play and when. And similarly, we want our swarm commander to be able to gesture or wave or think or speak the types of commands that would be useful for weaving together this large scale mission. So you see, you know, 20, 30, 40 drones being uh, taking off from one side of the, this urban environment. You'll have another 20, 30, 40 from the other side. You'll have rovers that are following along the, the road network that they were able to get from Google Maps um, and, and, and start moving into the city. They're gonna go look for windows and doors. And so you can imagine applying this to something like firefighting, where you need to deploy a set of unmanned systems to go and find out where the, the danger parts are, to make sure that the avenues, the roadways are clear for the first responders to come in, to be able to locate where there might be um, trapped individuals in upper story buildings and uh, rapidly be able to get uh, access to those buildings to be able to, to help, help those people out. And so you imagine, how do I orchestrate these swarms of robots, well, you can imagine all sorts of ways, but you're certainly not going to be telling each robot which GPS waypoint you're gonna be sending them to, but rather you're gonna be using these things we like to call swarm tactics. And you might be, for example, under virtual reality. So that bottom two videos that hopefully you can see, that's a virtual reality setup, looking at a 3D virtual world. You can click and point at buildings and say, I wanna go and inspect that building. And, and, and off they go. The swarm of agents figure out which air and ground robots should go off and, and, and go search that building. Again, let's say we need to find that, that, that trapped survivor in the upper story of a building. Or you might have your, your tablet. I'm just gonna pen sketch out, hey, these are the places that I want you to go and inspect. Here's the red zones that I want you to stay away because there might be power lines or other people or things of that nature. So these swarm tactics and how we communicate with the swarm is what the offset program's all about. So th that's been a lot of fun as well. Another area, so I've talked about the, the skies uh, for swarm on swarm battles. I've talked about the urban environment where there are those really challenging superstructures that you're gonna have to deal with. But another subdomain or another domain that's really hard is the underground environment. That underground environment is what inspired the DARPA subterranean challenge. And this is where it's a little bit of um, the amazing race uh, meets the Hunger Games. You have to go send teams of robots underground to go find artifacts or objects of interest. So it's a scavenger hunt underground. And it's a little bit like Hunger Games because we throw, DARPA goes and, and figures out what are all the different challenges that these robot teams need to go and be able to overcome. So we'll throw mud, we'll throw stairs, we'll have elevator shafts, we'll have uh, natural cave-like terrain, uh, really confined spaces and things of that nature to really put these robot teams to the test. And so 
the idea is you can't be just the best swimmer or the best runner, but in fact, all around best triathlete. And so we do that in the context of human-made tunnels, like in mines for mine search and rescue, the urban underground, let's say in subways or sewer systems or parking garages, where you might need to send robots in. Um, and then also the naturally occurring cave environments. This is nature's best effort uh, to make it really hard for robots to try to navigate these environments. And so DARPA is interested in the sub-T challenge, we like to call it the sub-T challenge, in generating this actionable situational awareness. That means going and finding these artifacts um, and, and reporting back where they are and what you found and doing that all within, let's say, the span of an hour. As I mentioned, we're interested in doing this in a way kind of triathlon, but we just don't want uh, the, the type of robots that will work in one place only. We want the types of robots to be resilient across a variety of different uh, technical challenges that they'll face. So we held the tunnel circuit, which is in a, in a coal mine. We did an urban circuit, which is in an unfinished nuclear power plant, uh, three stories of a nuclear power plant. We had intended to do a cave circuit, uh, but of course last year was rather challenging for everyone. Um, so we were able to identify a new way to study that problem. And we'll have our final event in September it's going to be a mashup of all three of these environments and really put these robot systems to the test. So because that's coming up, I wanted to spend just another minute or two sharing a little bit about that sub challenge. Here's how we structure the sub Here's how to win an, the event. Sub to win an so event in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. Find the most artifacts in the shortest amount of time. When, or if, a team system locates an artifact, it has to report not only the type of artifact, but also its spatially referenced location to an accuracy within five meters. A valid report earns one point, but teams are granted only a limited number of reports, so they can't just guess until they get lucky. Sound easy enough? Think again. Teams have to send their systems through dynamic terrain, over, under, and around obstacles, in austere navigation conditions, pushing the limits of their endurance and in conditions degrading sensing capabilities and severely constraining communications. So teams need to be agile, adaptive, and accurate if they want to emerge victorious in the Sub-T Challenge. So come follow along at hashtag sub -t challenge, of course. Um, you may have seen a, a variety of uh, robots out there now. This is some footage from our urban circuit. We're sending in these robots Humans are not allowed to see the course. They, they, have not, they don't know what's around the first bend. Here is a legged robot going down stairs or tracked robots or tethered robots or, or flying robots. Uh, it's um, amazing what these different teams are thinking about of building and demonstrating in these underground environments. So this is again, being that urban built up type environment. As I mentioned, the cave circuits uh, was hampered by COVID of course, but all along we've, understood the value of simulation and virtual environments. It was mentioned earlier about using serious games. This is the role of simulation in helping to facilitate that. So alongside these real world robots, we've had a virtual competition. And for the cave circuit, we were only able to hold a virtual competition. But in this game, you have a simulation that allows for teams to basically fantasy football league style develop their squad of robots that they're gonna go send in the virtual environments that DARPA creates of massive scales and proportions and have to do the same thing. They have to go and report out where these artifacts are located in those virtual environments. And that's all open source. Uh, so any of you wanna go play, you're welcome to do so. And so, as I mentioned, the finals are coming up. Uh, you'll be able to check us out online, follow along and see that live broadcast as that happens September 21st through 24th. But again, the key takeaway here is how do you get teams of robots to work in complex environments? And what are the technologies that all start from ideas like the ones that you probably are thinking about right now? And how do you materialize that into a uh, fielded and resilient system? And so with that, if you have any questions, I always welcome uh, engagement. Feel free to reach me at any of these emails or follow along at hashtag sub challenge. And uh, again, very much looking forward to all your questions. Good luck with your internship as well. Thanks. All right, that was, that was exciting. And so the students are actually uh, very interested in, in 
uh, excited about some of these challenges. Um, maybe we could start at, uh, start at the beginning. Um, there, there's a question from um, Dia about, uh, I think for Brad, about some of the synthetic biology work. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, I think someone um, already helped like answer my question by like putting a link in the chat um, about what your company does. But basically my question was, um, could you explain some of the projects or endeavors you have going on in relation to synthetic biology or anything in biology? Yeah, there's, there's uh, let's see, there's two or three. Let me talk about the first one that um, Raytheon has been working on for about 10 years now, and it was actually just licensed to a company called IDT in the last two weeks. But what Raytheon has done is take essentially cyber tools that are used to analyze packets of information on networks and adapt that approach to analyzing DNA sequences that you know are digitally provided to a, a house that's responsible to fabricate from the sequence that they're given. And what Raytheon was paid by the government to do was to develop cyber tools that would allow us to look through the digital D DNA sequences to make sure that there's no pathogens in there. Because we have, we have snippets of information pathogens and you have these long DNA sequences and the ability to break that data apart and analyze it for anything that's nefarious is very difficult. And Raytheon has been working over that, um, paid by the government to develop tools that like the last 10 years. And they've successfully done that, and they've now licensed that technology out. So there are a bunch of there are a bunch of companies actually in the Boston area, biotech companies that will take in a DNA sequence that they're provided and manufacture whatever it is that's in that sequence. And obviously, these companies don't want to manufacture something that's bad, the pathogenic sequence. And but in order to find out if something bad is in the total sequence, that data has to be analyzed. So that's the first tool that was worked on the last few years. It's, it's largely software applied to biology. Um, a second project that Raytheon was working on was believe it or not using um, a form of surface algae that can penetrate down in the soil and look under the soil for TNT, for explosive materials. The military application of that is obviously looking for explosives in the battlefield and trying to find them. And as opposed to digging up all the soil, could we develop approaches to allow you know, non-threatening algae to basically penetrate from the surface down up to three or four feet down to look for, um, you know, explosives. And then if they found the explosives, they would automatically fluoresce, fluoresce at the surface. So you could look for the fluorescence to find out if something bad there. Um, they're also working on some, some approaches today to look at um, detection of certain biologic fungi and things like that. Um, that. That's a particular approach. So those are examples of the application of of biology from a defensive standpoint and from a data analytics standpoint. Thank you so much. That was really interesting to hear about. Hey, um, Sanath, you had a question on um, uses of drones for the future. Okay, yeah. So, um, uh, I think uh, uh, a while back you showed your uh, you showed your presentation on how like the prediction of drone usage in the next five years, and you said that drones would be a lot more uh, closely used with humans. And based off of that prediction, that's why that's why I wanted to ask you: What do you think uh, are the uses of drones for in the next five years? Uh, I'll I'll take a stab at it for, and then I'll I'll turn it over to Tim see what he thinks because he spends a lot of time working this. No, I think I think um, you know drones are limited by range and payload, right? So from an aerodynamic standpoint, your ability I'll, I'll use a quad as an example, a vertical drone. So in order to, to take off and land, you've got to and, and go over a certain range. You've got to have a payload, and you've got to have a propulsion system. You got the ability to sustain yourself, to sustain the system aloft. So once you get past that, you understand. Okay, I can I can have this drone or quad fly a certain distance and carry a certain payload. Then it determines what payload you can provide. There are all kinds of payloads that are being developed. You know, small cameras, small radar, small sensors that could be looking for acoustics or biological information. All that's being done. And so that's happening. The second piece of it, though, that, that has to pass muster is the airworthiness and the certification, the ability to fly that in the national airspace. It's one thing to have a drone or a quad you can use on a battlefield where you're not as concerned about commercial aviation. But when the, when the Federal Aviation Administration has to worry about safe transport for everybody around the United States, they get really worried about what's flying around in the air. And so the, the national airspace in the United States is carefully regulated. First and foremost, to be very conservative from a safety standpoint, so we don't have accidents. 
So once that process gets sorted out with autonomous drones from a safety standpoint and regulation and who flies it, as that evolves, my prediction is you'll see more and more drones all over the place. You know, a, a big part of like, uh, I think Amazon's desire to deliver, you know, to remote sites wasn't necessarily could they do it, but it was getting the certification approval to do it. So if something went wrong, it was all insured and it was all proper, if that makes sense. That's, that's my thoughts. I think you're going to see it everywhere. Tim, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, you know, drones have taken off, pun intended, uh, in terms of usage and so forth. Um, I, I think, you know, payload delivery, just like you mentioned, Brad, I think that's going to be an interesting area, right? Once we sort out how to get, uh, how to deliver medicine, how to deliver food and resources. We see folks from a humanitarian and disaster response perspective, you know, the, the trucks can't make it through all the debris. And so maybe we can airlift some things in there. It could be at the small scale. It could be at the much larger scale. At that point, now you can even imagine bringing bringing in supplies or evacuating personnel. Um, so you can you can imagine a lot of really interesting things happening there. Uh, personally, I I think that uh, when you have teams of robots going out and do things, you'll get way more than just drone light shows over the Super Bowl. But in fact, um, a lot more things happening. Um, you know, when, when when you can use all these things uh, in concert. Should be pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for your response, Gail. I really, I really appreciated it. Hey, um, Mehdi, you had a question on some new applications of swarms. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if DARPA had ventured into using swarm robotics to collect data for environmental sciences or ecological initiatives, since that seems like an interesting future direction. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of work in uh, leveraging not just onesies and twosies, but larger numbers of being able to do things, for example, like agriculture, being able to uh, scour agricultural fields, know where there are pest, you know, pests or infections or, or need for more water. Um, there's been applications of deploying uh, swarms for uh, wildlife preservation. In fact, even in Antarctica, trying to count penguins and making sure that they're uh, all safe and accounted for. So I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities uh, countering poachers uh, is, is one application, um, you know, forest management, and in fact, things like even fighting wildfires and early response to those kind of scenarios. So I think there's a broad range of applications that these types of technologies uh, can and have been thought about. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So um, there's a question on uh, from Joseph Chai on autonomy and space exploration. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So uh, my question is, would Raytheon or DARPA ever consider like moving into the planet turf formation field on like for um, interplanetary like space travel and like, uh, you know, people, humanity being an interplanetary species and use swarm technologies for like topography and reconnaissance missions um, to better understand planets such as Mars? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um... Well, I'll let Tim answer the DARPA one specifically. I know they they have a program doing nuclear thermal propulsion, and one of the purposes of that is to increase. Essentially, it's not necessarily interplanetary, but it's to do a much better job of propulsion in space. So he can talk about that. Um, what I will say is is um, Raytheon. There, there's some scientists at Raytheon that are talking to NASA today about the applications of synthetic biology, not necessarily to terraforming, to but to provide in situ logistics support on the moon and Mars. In other words, are there ways of, of developing synthetic biology capabilities so that we don't have to transport everything from one planet to another? I mean, there's just, it, it's, it's uh, interplanetary travel is a big giant logistical nightmare, separate from how long it takes. It's just, it's, it's heavy on logistics. But Tim, what do you think about that? Yeah, Brad, thanks. Um, you know, I think I think there are a number of initiatives that are going on right now that might actually have impact in those kind of environments. Uh, Brad mentioned the, the ability to, to travel long distances. What's the next kind of propulsion approach that we can imagine or energy sources we can take advantage of uh, for, for things like space travel? Um, there's uh, the extraction of water from the atmosphere. It turns out, of course, a large part of the lift is being able to provide water for humans. And so being able to extract that wherever you might be, and of course, Mars might be a tough place to go and execute that, but you can imagine many of the arid environments that we have to operate in uh, could be great to kind of see what it means to leverage uh, that kind of um, water extraction technology. 
similarly, being able to convert you know raw mar- uh, throwaway materials into uh, either construction materials or other things, being able to repurpose, scavenge, um, and and study that aspect uh, can help out in austere environments. But you know, one can imagine that being applied to space as well. And I'll throw out that the sub G challenge we have a NASA team in the competition. And one of the main interests there are things like the lava tubes on the surface of Mars, being able to explore those environments and understand if those could be potentially hospitable for housing that next Mars base or whatnot. So I think there are a number of opportunities there that many of the technologies, as well as the partnerships with places like NASA will really open up some of, the, some of that aperture. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so Oz- Ozan, you have a question, um, I think for maybe both of them. So it's no secret that scientific innovations are to be considered alongside their ethical ramifications. So I was wondering, what would you say to the many engineers who could potentially fuel innovation within the defense sector, but ultimately uncomfortable with the possibility of their work being employed in military aggression? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I think that uh, from the standpoint of, I'll talk about Raytheon and intelligence space. No, I think from the standpoint of Raytheon intelligence space, um, there are many engineers and scientists that want to work on technology for both commercial and for defense purposes. And I think most everybody finds a, a natural place for them to do that. If they have a, an ethical concern, I'm sure they voice that. Uh, I know that the Department of Defense considers um, technology. I, I know specifically DARPA does that. They consider the ramifications of technology from an ethical standpoint. I mean, autonomy is a great example. It's It's pretty well known that the uh, the U.S. Defense and Intelligence Community Establishment is extremely rigorous on the utilization and employment of two things, a- autonomous systems, um, and also on, on the application of biology. We're much more rigorous and ethically minded on that than many of our adversaries are. But you're right, every, every scientist and engineer has to analyze the work they're doing and decide is it something they want to do or not. And I think that's, you know, we're in a free society and that's part of that. Tim, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, fantastic question, and it's certainly something that um, you know all technologists uh, can and should be thinking about. As Brad mentioned here at DARPA, one of the things in the Department of Defense and at DARPA specifically, we take that responsibility pretty seriously in the technologies that we're interested in. Uh, for example, for autonomy, uh, Department of Defense has a directive that basically says that we can't uh, and shouldn't be developing those types of autonomous uh, lethal capabilities. Uh, at DARPA, we have a review board that looks at the legal, social, and ethical implications of many of the technologies, such as autonomy, that we develop. So I think that's less, um, you know, if, if you're already working within Department of Defense or DARPA, then you know, we're already developing technologies with that ethical mindset in place. I think your question about uh, those who are kind of on the edge and might have misgivings. I think that's exactly a reason why we want those people who are critical thinkers, always wondering, thinking about, being conscientious about the legal, ethical, and social ramifications of the technologies that we are interested in and bringing that conversation to the fore, not not shying away from being able to to have those discussions. And and, and I'm glad that that question came up today because it means that we're all thinking about um, precisely the right things as we advance these technologies. That, that was great. Great question. A- Aiden, you had a question about how to get involved in uh, challenges? Oh, okay. Yeah. If we wanted to participate in a DARPA challenge or program, what would be the academic steps that you would suggest um, to work our way to doing so? Oh, fantastic question. That's music to my ears. Fred, I'll go ahead and just take oh, Also, um, yeah, before I say, do. when I was in fifth grade, there was a DARPA robotics challenge and I really wanted to enter. And I, and I did like a ton of stuff trying to get uh, like, like my fellow middle schoolers to help out and try to get into it. Unfortunately, it never worked out and I became really sad about it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you were so sad, but you know, maybe now is a good chance to reconnect. Um, I think uh, to speak to your point, it, it really depends on the nature of the challenge uh, but for example, the sub challenge is really wide open. So we have uh, college students. We even had a team with a middle school. So uh, maybe a little too late for, for your middle school experience. But we had a team of middle schoolers develop a small ground robot that was deployed at the urban circuit. Uh, and that was part of a team. 
we have uh, uh, teams that employ their undergraduates from their university. So it, it really spans uh, the gamut from professional engineer all the way down to middle schoolers. And that's the nature of you never know when you're going to get the next best idea. And that could happen in a garage workshop or in a, in a lab somewhere. So uh, to answer your question, I'd say just what you all, all 300 plus of you doing right now is taking the initiative to go and learn, right? Learn, do projects, take internships, find mentors, latch onto them. Um, and all of that initiative boils down to finding a path to challenge like projects. And if there's a DARPA challenge that's going on, much like the robotics challenge or the sub T challenge or whatever happens in the future, um, you'll be well positioned, I think, to be able to bring your skill sets and that, that drive, that enthusiasm. Um, but that's, you know, that's music to my ears uh, that, that uh, you as fifth grade and you as um, you know, junior, sophomore, maybe rising senior uh, is interested. That, that, that means these challenges are doing their job of inspiring young minds like yourself. And uh, the next best way to get involved in a challenge is to propose ideas for what that next challenge should be. So I encourage you to think about what a next DARPA challenge should look like and uh, send it over our way. Svat Hasri, you have a question um, for both of them, it's looking for some advice to, for all the students. Uh, yeah, so I was just gonna ask, um, what's like the largest piece of advice that you would give yourself as a high schooler, like knowing what you already know now, because we're obviously all high schoolers and just looking for some advice. Oh, wow, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Boy, I'm trying to think because I've got, I've got three kids and all three of them are older than you. So um, I think, you know, look, first first off, the fact that 330 of you are on this call and then you're in this program means you're already curious. That's the most important thing. Never, ever inhibit your curiosity or the desire to continue to learn. Um, you know, the only limit of what I spend my time on every day learning technically is the hours in the day because I have other responsibilities. But you know, I've had, a, I've had a lifelong curiosity of technology, and the most important thing is just to sustain it and keep learning something new, because in the area of technology, your entire life, it is going to change. And what that means is um, continuous learning is so important and, and keeping that spirit alive. And if you do that and you stay involved, you, you'll satisfy that curiosity and you'll just enjoy the day. Uh, that's, that's my best thought. Yeah, we get this question a lot, as you might imagine, and there's no one path to, to, you know, to go forward. And many of you, I think, will discover your own paths. One way to help that, in addition to always having that lifelong learning, which was number one on my list as well, um, is, uh, you know, feel free to reach out. Feel free to ask questions, um, much like you're doing right now. Uh, ask questions from potential mentors or actual mentors or, uh, you know, students that um, were in the upper class ahead of you or, or things like that. I think asking questions in all sorts of ways and, and to whomever you get the opportunity to, that one sentence or one conversation could really be uh, pretty, pretty exciting for you. It could be where you find a lot of inspiration. And um, I think that's the, the nugget is whether you're lifelong learning, whether you're engaging with other people, whether you're uh, having those kind of discussions, it's where you find inspiration. And that inspiration is what's going to continue to drive you. So uh, take every opportunity you can to go uh, meet someone new, talk with somebody different, uh, learn something uh, each and every day. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll add is don't assume that the path to all this for you will be linear. Don't assume that, well, I lay out this path, I do this next and this happens. It's not the way it works. For many of us, um, I don't want to say it's a random, it's a random walk experiment, but for many of us, we do different things at different times in different places and, and opportunities arrive. So what you can do is just do the best of whatever you're doing and, and grow your network of people that you know. And as you do that, that intersection of your desire and your ability, plus your network opportunities will open themselves up to you. And then it's just a question of, hey, do I want to take advantage of that opportunity and try something new? Now, I've done three completely different things in my adult career, completely different. I had no idea at the start that was going to happen. So my career certainly wasn't linear by any stretch. So don't assume it will be. That's fantastic. So I want to thank you both once again for, for joining us today. These talks were fantastic. And your, your advice to the students is spot on for sure. Um, right now, I'd like to um, ask Allison Wu and Daniel Chuang to 
unmute and they'd like to thank you personally. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel, a student from Racecar and Beaverworks. Uh, my peer, Allison, and I, and I are here today to express the gratitude that our students have towards DARPA, Beaverworks, and of course, our distinguished speakers. Mr. Tuesley, thank you for sharing your professional insights, offering us with internship opportunities, and providing us with your predictions for all of our respective courses. Um, that was one of the most unique things I've seen in a presentation. Um, Moreover, thank you for sending all the Arduino kits over us, uh, over to us, and I'll be on the lookout for Raytheon components the next time I'm on a plane. Mr. Chung, the, the excitement that you had while you were speaking was very infectious. Um, thank you for providing us with the, I don't, I don't know how to present, pronounce it, but the Hailmeyer framework and telling us about the Swarm Drone Challenge and the Sub-T Challenge, which are probably some of the coolest robotics things I've ever seen. Um, I've said a lot now, so Allison, you can take it away from here. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, we're so grateful that both of you were able to speak to us today. And on behalf of Beaverworks, we would like to present you both with um, t-shirts virtually. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.